welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest. Her name is Susie or Suzanne Hansen. Uh, she's a former school teacher, author, uh, UFO sighting research investigator, contact experiencer, public speaker, and has studied grief counseling. She's the author of The Dual Soul Connection, The Alien Agenda for Human Advancement, uh, with contribu uh, contributions by Rudy, Dr. Rudy Schild, uh, Emeritus Professor of Astrophysics at Harvard and Smithsonian, and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, USA. Uh, she's a former director of the UFO of UFO CUS, a New Zealand uh, research network. In 2000, she's uh, 48 years experience in UFO sighting investigation and research. Uh, she lobbied for the release of the New Zealand MOD uh, Ministry of Defense UFO files disclosed in 2010 and 2011. She's the founding co coordinator of Communicator Link Advocacy and Support for Experiencers and Abductees. She's a founding member of New Zealand Representative Australasian Continental Director and an Executive Board Member of ICER, oh, uh, International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research, consisting of scientists, academics, and leading UFO UAP, UAP researchers with representatives in 30 countries on five continents. Susie has lectured and conducted workshops internationally since 1997 in the US, UK, Canada, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Australia, and New Zealand. She has featured, she has been featured in interviews, articles, and documentaries, which I won't name here. Uh, welcome to tonight's show, uh, Susie Hansen. Do you like to be called Susie or Suzanne? Susie, thank you, Mike. Okay, Susie. Um, uh, welcome to tonight's show. How are you this evening? Pretty good. It's uh, morning here, 10 o'clock in the morning, and it's a reasonably nice day. So summer is coming and spring has arrived. What 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 day is it for you? Sunday? It's Sunday, Sunday morning. Oh, you're you're uh, you're time traveling into the future. Yes, we are first to see the sun. <laughs> so are you near the international date line? Well, we're first to see the sun, so we, you know, as time goes, um, we're we're well ahead of everyone else in the world. Um, so let's just jump straight into your own experiences. What's the very first strange experience of any kind? It doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's odd, extremely interesting, and and strange. <laughs> What was the first thing that happened to you? When well, you I had uh, I had experiences throughout childhood, but they were more remembered in, in a dreamlike state, or remembered the next day. And as a child, I I dismissed them as dreams. My mother dismissed them as dreams. So moving forward to when I was twenty was when I had a catalyst experience of um, travelling on a back country road with a flatmate and. Um, seeing a light appearing in, uh, up ahead of us over the hills, um, two lights actually side by side, very bright, which we assumed were the landing lights of an agricultural aircraft going into land on a farm. Uh, but they disappeared very quickly, um, like instantly. So we just thought that the aircraft had changed direction. Um, but they appeared right next to us instantaneously over the hills on our left. Um, and at this point, we slowed the car to a stop to see what was going on. They disappeared again, reappeared further up ahead of us and disappeared a third time. Um, we didn't know what it was. Um, my flatmate was assuming it was a helicopter. Um, I was thinking maybe it was a UFO because that was already in my reality from a family UFO sighting when I was eight years old. Um, and so we, we started off in like first gear, then into second gear very slowly. And um, and we were heading along a very long two and a half K straight. We're just at the beginning of it when he said, um, what, whatever it is, it's coming up behind us. And within a few seconds, this massive light that was wider than a road, like a great uh, elliptical light, 
very bright, painful um, to the eyes, came over the car. The whole car was filled with bright light. Um, everything looked kind of silver. It was accompanied by a terrible graunching, metallic graunching sound is the best way I can describe it. And we, we say that UFOs are quiet, but in my experience, they are not always quiet. Um, it came over the car and as I turned my head to look at my flatmate, uh, in this bright light, I could see that uh, he was no longer driving in a car. He'd kind of collapsed against the door jam. His hands were not on the wheel. Um, the car seemed to be stationary. And then um, I felt it lift off the road in the same way that we feel an aircraft lift off the tarmac and kind of leaves our stomach behind, that kind of feeling. And at that point, um, I passed out. But before I did, I could hear this a woman screaming and years later I realized it was actually me. Um, so it was a very traumatic uh, incident and um, the next thing we knew was um, a feeling of being woken up like something had made a loud noise that had woken me up and I was in a state of confusion because everything was black around me, it was dark and I didn't know what was happening. My hair, long hair, was blowing all around my head. My window was open, and um, it had been open at the beginning of the experience. And uh, we were headed towards um, the lights came on in the car, the engine started. There was a feeling of flotation, so as if the car was just gently undulating. And then with a bit of a crash, uh, the tyres hit the road as if we'd been dropped or put down. Uh, the lights were shining on a one-way bridge up ahead of us in the countryside and my flatmate was like he'd just woken up and was in an absolute panic struggling to get control of the car and get it um, over that over that one-way bridge as it loomed up very quickly. <clears throat> um, we argued for about half an hour, I suppose, about what had happened because we'd gone from late afternoon, beautiful golden sunshine, and now it was dark, it was night. And um, we had no idea what had happened or how that could be. And he maintained, well, we saw a helicopter, but he could not understand where the time had gone and why it was now dark. So we were both in a, in a real state of shock. And I guess after that suffered some PTSD. When we got back to our flat after a very icy and silent journey because we weren't getting anywhere arguing with each other, um, our flatmates told us we were uh, an hour and a half late because we told them when we intended to be home. Um, the program, the news we expected to see on New Zealand television wasn't on, it was a later program. And our dinner in the oven was ruined. We had no idea what to say to them. They fired questions at us because they could see we looked shocked and angry. Um, we both retreated to our rooms because we could not answer the questions. So I tried to pin my flatmate down to discussing it with me over the, the following weeks. He became extremely angry every time because he was a scientist actually and he had no answers. He was completely confounded, as was I. And um, he eventually became a very angry, insular person from the outgoing and very um, fun-loving and humorous person that he had been. And he left the flat and I lost contact with him. Um, so that really catapulted me headlong into UFO sighting research in New Zealand at the age of 20 and um, and also into seeking anyone or keeping my ear to the ground uh, to try to find someone who had experienced something similar. Because in those days, um, missing time was unheard of in New Zealand. Um, contact was unheard of, greys were unheard of, all of those things. So it was quite terrifying. You felt I felt very alone and I'm sure he did too. And um, he, he dealt with it his way and I dealt with it mine, which was to delve into the subject and try to find out what had happened to us and what was going on. So did you end up getting regressed? I did eventually, but not for about another 20 to 30 years. Um, there were several researchers who were trying to 
encouraged me to to have um, hypnotherapy at that uh, in the years that followed. However, um, there was such a lot of controversy around it at the time, and John Mack was doing his work and Bud Hopkins and others, as I found out eventually. But um, but there was still a lot of controversy around how successful this was. So I actually didn't have hypnotherapy for a very long time, and I just maintained my my um, memories. And as it happens, I had a number of catalyst um, experiences once I'd realized I was actually having contact with greys and had actually seen them, been taken on board craft with them and had memory of this. My, my memories went from being piecemeal, a little bit here and a little bit there and a memory of this and a memory of that, a slight recall or something else, went to um, the point where I could remember entire episodes, where I was picked up, how it happened, what it looked like in the craft, what we did, what the activity was, what the uh, entities looked like. So I'm quite fortunate that I have a lot of um, very full memory, but I also have those experiences where, um, where there are a lot of gaps. And so eventually um, I decided to have some regression to fill in some of those gaps to try to gain a better picture of what was going on for me. So if you remember a lot more, uh, by all means, go, if you're one, uh, willing to, go to your next experience after the one that you just spoke about. Okay, well, um, after that, I had a number of experiences that involved what I now understand to be being part of a, um, a hybrid program. But I suppose the next one was a, a bit of a paranormal kind of experience as well, in that um, I had sensed that there were these entities around me. I had seen them by now. I knew what they looked like. And I was scared because I had two little children and I, I worried about what might happen to us or what might happen to them. And um, on one occasion, uh, I sensed that there was actually a grey around me. And um, I sort of got a bit angry about this because I, I wanted to know why it was scaring me and I, and I needed to understand what was happening. And, um, and so I asked him to give me some kind of sign uh, that he was really there and that I was not imagining it because it was scaring me. And um, my husband was, my former husband was there at the time and there was a terrific crash within a few seconds out in the hallway at the back of the house. We both ran out there and uh, found that a large mirror, a, a very heavy old antique mirror had come off, fallen off the wall. We assumed that the nail had pulled out or whatever, but when we examined it, we saw that the cord was not broken because it was actually a wire. The, um, the hook was still in the wall, so something had lifted it off, and it's a very heavy mirror, but it had been lifted up and off and then um, basically not crashed, but put to the floor enough to make a sound to alert us to what was happening. And at the same time, um, I was seeing this, the, the grey in my mind trying to communicate with me. And, um, and I closed myself off at that time because I was too worried about what was happening. The next catalyst um, incident that changed my attitude, changed my life, was a couple of years later when um, I came to or came out of what I call the altered state and I was standing in my hallway with my eldest son and there were three greys with us. They were communicating with each other and, um, and I could hear them. I could hear what they were saying and they were saying that, uh, you know, we were going to be going, etc., talking about the transport. And I realized that my youngest son, because my husband was away, would be left alone in the house. So um, I began communicating quite naturally with them telepathically, um, basically setting up a bargain with them that one of them would stay with him for a brief time while we were gone. And, um, and this is what occurred. And they said, um, she un I heard one of them say telepathically, she understands, and it's time for her to remember more. So what had happened was I'd slipped out of the altered state they'd put me in. It hadn't scared me. I'd communicated naturally with them. They'd communicated back and they'd realized that they could now start increasing my memories. 
and that really is the point that uh, the fear dropped away. Um, the feeling that I was involved in something long term was very strong and uh, the memories of my experiences were quite were pretty full and complete after that. So you said you were uh, part of the hybrid program. Did they use your eggs or what, what happened? Yes, and I have, like many experiencers, I have met those um, hybrid children on the craft um, and seen where they are today many years later and what they're doing. But I don't want to reveal too much about that at the moment because I'm still doing some investigation into that and writing about it. And this is your second book that you're working on? Yes, yes. And uh, so... Uh, well, uh, go over whatever you feel that you're um, okay with talking about that you don't want to, I mean, I know that uh, you don't want to give away your book for free. Nobody wants to do that. It's more that it's more that um, it involves other members of my family and, um, and until I have uh, their permission and understanding and they've seen what I've written, um, it's better that I don't talk about it out of respect to them. So um, what would you like to, um, Ben, is, you know, we just want to fill up an hour at least. Uh, what would you like to talk about uh, in reference to your experiences that maybe you've already revealed it in your previous book or, um, or how would you, what do you want, what would you like to talk about? Well, um, we can talk about the agenda that I describe in the book, if you wish. Sure. Okay, so um, when I was eight years old, um, my family had a UFO sighting um, of a long bar-like, like a, a long ruler, basically, in the sky that was over a ser series of hills about 20 kilometres from where I lived. It was a Friday night and it was an extremely bright object in the sky um, and we couldn't work out what it could possibly be. My father saw it first and came and got the rest of us to go out on the terrace and have a look at it. We looked at it through a very old telescope and we could see that it was flaring, um, it pulsing, shall we say. Uh, it was very bright orange and there was nothing um, in New Zealand at that time that could create an object like that in the sky. It certainly wasn't a helicopter, it was very big. So my my parents called the neighbours out. They'd, um, they came out onto their terrace next door and we were calling out to them and discussing things. And uh, we later learned that there were other people in the, in the area we lived in, which was elevated, who were also observing it. Um, so a lot of discussion went on. We watched it for a period of an hour and a half. And at that time, it began moving south uh, over the central North Island. And uh, either the next day or the following, it was reported in our national newspaper. And um, apparently hundreds, if not thousands of people had seen it and there was no explanation for it. Uh, that was early winter. And, um, and I think that it really intrigued me. Uh, it really woke me up to the possibility that um, if this was a, a flying saucer, as my mother referred to it, then um, then someone had to be flying it. So it really um, got into my psyche and made me very excited about that possibility. Uh, another strange thing happened around that time, which I do believe is related, and that is um, I had this sudden thirst for knowledge. So I would read the neighbours the retired school teacher next door, I'd read her encyclopedias and and a lot of her books. I was a very good a reader, advanced for my age, and um, and I seemed to have this thirst for learning that I couldn't quench, and I did very well at school that year. But the other thing that developed throughout that year, more than it had done already, because I'd already from early childhood seen spirits and been able to describe them, but um, I began seeing auras around people, uh, knowing what they were going to think before they said it, um, had precognition about events or visits or people coming to see us or telephone us, all of those kinds of things that a lot of experiencers experience. So there was this psychic development going on at the same time. 
but um, I also had memory of being on board of what I now know to be a craft, but in those days I didn't really know where I was in a dream state as I remembered it. I would be in a very white room and um, there would be these strange creatures around me who it was as if I was my my sight was veiled and that I would try to look at them and see their face, but I couldn't, but they were there. They were non-threatening. They were talking to me and communicating with me and they were teaching me things. Of course, now as an adult, I understand that um, I'm remembering differently to how it actually happened and that the, the actual uh, image of their face and bodies was shielded from my conscious life as Susie Hansen as a child because that would have been not only probably frightening to recall, but if I'd talked about it to other people, they probably would have thought I was a Fruit Loop. So um, so I guess that was a protection mechanism from, from the greys. But um, at that age, I did have outlined to me um, some kind of agenda where uh, there were going to be, I was going to be a part of it, that it was very complex and multi-layered. And they put a lot of information into my mind, which did not come out until much later as an adult. And I began to piece information together and realize what was going on. So in my book, I describe the three waves agenda. Now, um, Dolores Cannon has written about this too. She um, obtained a copy of my a speech I did in 2007 in Australia and um, where I described, briefly described this um, agenda and put up a, a quite a complicated chart on the screen about it. And uh, Dolores later wrote about this herself. But um, the information that was given to me I, was far more than what Dolores was able to get out of people, I think, because um, they told me that they would put the information into my mind in three layers and uh, I would only remember maybe the first layer and then the second layer and then as an adult I would completely understand the rest of it. So um, this happened twice when I was eight years old going on craft being talked to about this agenda and the interesting thing is that on the second occasion I um, stood in front of what I call a senior grey. I had a nickname for him at that stage, which was the grandfather and two other greys. So I stood in front of them and while they were talking to me, they also thanked me for being part of this. And um, I recall out of their body emanated this red or pinkish red glow from the lower torso. And, um, and what surprised me and shocked me actually, is the strong memory of looking down at my white pajamas that I was wearing and seeing a glow coming out of my own body. And that was the, the first time that I realized that I was somehow or other a part of them and they were part of me. So we're talking about a genetic link here um, and also a consciousness link. <clears throat> so the three waves of gender involves um, three groups of souls coming into the planet to incarnate for certain reasons. There's a first wave that is broken into two so that uh, the first part of them came in quite early, um, around about the early 1900s, and the second wave came in later on. And we, we, we really refer to that second part of the first wave, sorry, as um, many people call them the star kids, but the souls that have come in to um, teach us and show us what we can do. So a lot of them are artists and um, musicians and, and lead a very alternative life. The second wave is a finite wave. By that I mean it's people around my age group and either side of my age group. And it's the biggest group of people on the planet. And I think that most experiencers a part of the second wave and they were here they were part of the hybrid program they are here to um, expose the or disclose the contact um, arena and um, many of those who incarnated a little earlier uh, are under the title of abductee because they had a, a very rough time getting used to this whole scenario 
Um, and the third wave is made up of the children of the second wave, the children of the experiencers and abductees. And these ones have been described as the grey by the greys as the game changers. So they will come into the planet and many of them are in their thirties and forties now. And uh, get into professional positions or all kinds of positions in their line of work, etc., where they are able to make a difference. And by that I mean right across the board, in the medical field, in um, in education, in law, in every way that you can think, they will make a difference. And they'll be in positions of responsibility by the time this uh, these changes happen. And I think we really are on a planet in the beginning stages of those changes now. We're seeing a need to change our laws, the way we educate children and, and adults. Uh, our medical systems are in collapse and no longer um, working pro properly worldwide. And so there's this the, a call for change, really, and it's these souls who are going to bring in that change. Now, the second wave, which I'm part of, have had a, a large education on board craft from early childhood or before, when they were still before they'd incarnated. But the third wave, that's our children, the specific children, um, they've had a much, much bigger um, education by the greys. And um, but they are what the greys refer to as the concealed ones. So they are not overt in the in what they can do psychically or through consciousness or all of those kinds of talents and abilities. Um, they're very quiet about it. They use it, but they don't shout it from the rooftops. So when they really begin their work to assist um, humanity and the planet, which many of them are just starting to do now, then um, they will, will have a lot of... Um, information that we don't have that that comes to them and is going to rise to their consciousness. So an example of this is that um, recently I've had two experiencers that I consider to be third waivers, one in their late 30s and one in their mid 40s, who I have been assisting um, by assessing their manuscripts for books that they are writing about how they have suddenly recovered memories, they've suddenly um, had this activation of, of their consciousness. They are remembering some of their uh, experiences on board craft and conversations and lectures and teaching that they've had. Uh, they're beginning to understand why they're here and what the, what it is that they need to do. So everything that the Greys laid out to me throughout my life as an experiencer, I am now seeing coming to um, fruition and, and certainly um, becoming obvious on the planet. So, uh, do you want to kind of go over your experiences or what what is in the book you've already written or what do you want to focus on? I'd quite like to um, talk about some of the technology um, that I've seen because this is um, this is kind of a current theme at the moment coming out with a lot of the government whistleblowers. Sure. So um, throughout my life of experiences, um, which has been lifelong, but I'm, I'm going to focus on what I have, technology I've seen since the age of, say, 20 as an adult. Um, a lot of the technology that I saw on craft was so advanced to me, it was quite magical. Um, but with being taught how to use some of this, I began to understand what the ETs were actually doing. So as a 12 year old child, I was able to observe the, some of the technology that they use on a regular basis. But as an adult, I found myself in groups of humans who were having tests on board craft that concerned the technology. So it, it took a while for me to realise um, that the technology they were exposing us to was like what I describe as a bridging technology. 
So I think that a lot of the technology we now have on the planet or perhaps have in secret that's being developed, I believe has come from the ETs one way or another, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But just continuing with the technology. So um, we were introduced to technology that I believe was bridging. So it was not as, as um, mystical and magical as their technology seemed to be. It was it was um, a little less sophisticated than that. And I now realize that they were um, experimenting. They were testing us to see how far they could stretch us with the technology and how much of their technology they could allow into this new technology they were developing, which we have since developed. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, back in the 90s, I had an, an ex onboard craft experience, which was very in-depth that was part of a test that I did and um, with a group of people and we were given a task to do. The task was not so much that we had to solve the problem that each of us was given. The task was more about seeing how well we could use the technology that they provided us with. Having been exposed to this technology and taught how to use it, they wanted to see how far we'd come in being very adept at using it and understanding how it worked. So in this test, um, some of the things that I could describe back in the 90s was swipe screens. Well, in the 90s, we didn't have computers in New Zealand until the mid 90s, and then that was only at institutions like universities and medical schools. So I had never been exposed to a computer, and yet I could describe things that we now have, like swipe screens, like um, paper-thin computers that could be rolled up, which we are now trying to develop, uh, like using your mind to operate the cursor or to go into different levels on, on the screen, different icons and symbols. We now do that as, as routine on our computers. Um, so many of these aspects of the use of a computer we are now seeing coming out in our own technology. For example, in at this time, I used what I referred to as an information tablet because um, in layman's terms, I had no wa other way of describing it. It was like an X-ray sheet, a very thin X-ray sheet, and it was powered by some kind of power, but there was no obvious power source. And um, you, you know, you could use your mind to go into the icons and seek information and bring it out in a 3D form. So what I was describing is basically what we now see, except not 3D form, um, in our tablets that people carry around quite routinely. When I first began talking about these things in uh, 1997, it was it sounded crazy because uh, we didn't have a lot of that technology and we're only developing it now. But some of the other technology I have seen on craft, um, I have recently found other experiencers who've observed exactly the same. So, for example, um, way back decades ago, I saw a handheld um, X-ray machine, if you can put it that way. So it was just looked like a a table tennis bat really, but the underside had a lot of lights on it and the upper side had some buttons or things that you pressed. And on craft, this was used to look into the body so they could hold it over your body or your arm or your head or whatever, and they could change the specs of that screen so that they could see your veins or your bones, or your organs, or whatever. They could just look into the body in real time, find problems, look at tumours, or find bleeds, and find things in veins, etc. <clears throat> so um, decades later, we have now developed a similar piece of technology called the Vein Viewer. And it has uh, red lights underneath that uh, shine onto the skin. And, um, and it shows up the veins and it assists nurses in being able to put in a lure or a needle in the right place, etc. So it only has that one function, whereas theirs has multiple functions. And in our understanding of science and physics, we haven't reached the level that they have had, that they have reached. But we are getting to a 
a minimal point where we, we're starting to move a little closer or understand new, new forms of physics. So I have found um, two people, two experiencers who've seen that exact same handheld object um, and they had both discussed it and drawn pictures about it independently a long time ago before they ever got in contact with me. So this is corroborative evidence. Scientists and other people may not see it as evidence. They might say it's coincidence. But I think that uh, it's very difficult for an experiencer to prevent, present any kind of evidence at all, apart from lifting something and taking it off the craft, which they're never going to allow you to do. And so this is evidence of, of a kind, I guess. And the, the other um, object that I have seen on craft is a large light elevator, which you can get in and you can move between levels of the craft. And I've also found two experiencers who had drawn this exact same piece of apparatus and were able to describe it in the same way as me. So to me, as an experiencer, that's enough evidence for me that those things were real, that I wasn't imagining it, and that other people have seen it too. And when you see that same technology starting to be developed in our own world, you have to wonder where that has come from. Why would we develop something that so closely matches what experiencers have seen on a craft, unless we'd had some help to do that, either by back engineering a craft or by being given the information by the ETs in some way. Um, so the technology is a very interesting side of the whole UFO scene because um, I can understand that, that certain groups or corporations stand to make a lot of money if they can develop some um, ET or originating technology. Uh, so it's a matter of that technology being developed in the right way for the right purposes. And I know that the ETs are very worried and concerned about the way we use technology to harm each other and I'm sure that they don't want that um, technology used in that way and would make every attempt to stop that happening and I think we've seen that with some of the nuclear um, plants where UFOs have been seen over them and have um, shut down missiles or interfered with computers and um, technology there to prevent certain things from happening. <clears throat> so, um, do you follow Twitter now? No, not at the moment. Okay, so are you familiar with what Daniel Sheehan and his uh, group are doing behind the scenes with the with Congress at the, at the moment? Yes, yes. So you know, you know they're about to release. Um, well, I don't know if they are or not, but the rumor floating around that I've seen on Twitter in the last week is that um, Daniel Sheehan and his, he's a lawyer, he's one of the two UFO lawyers in D.C. They're supposedly got an office they're opening in D.C. this week, and it's, um, they're, uh, they claim the government is going to release everything that's 25 years or older, which means the the uh, Roswell stuff, the Betty and Barney Hill stuff, all all that stuff, all the government information that they've never mentioned about any of those events um, is supposed to get released very soon. And I don't, that's just a rumor floating around, doesn't mean it's going to happen. But I just, um, I assume you've seen the um, the craft pieces that have been floating around publicly that where they sh show the, the uh, layered pieces that are done at the atomic level and they're, um, I think Strieber, uh, how did this, how did that play out? Strieber got it and he got it from somebody and he gave it to uh, Linda Moulton Howell and she gave it to, and it just keeps floating around and eventually, I don't know who studied it uh, in the labs, but um, have you had any uh, implants of your own? Uh, 
Um, yes. <clears throat> in um, about, uh, when was it? When I was about 20, no, 19, I had a rather horrific car accident. And, um, and the episode, the event that I talked about right at the beginning of this interview where my car was lifted off the road, that is one of the um, events that I have had some regression on to see why that happened. And um, what happened was that they were they were checking on implants that they had put in directly after that accident, because I had multiple injuries and I've had long term effects from it. But um, the, they explained to me that the implants were minimizing some of those effects and they were quite devastated that um, that this had happened to me. I actually got a warning um, just prior to the car accident happening. I was standing talking to a group of people. They were officials from a group that, um, that we had been visiting. Uh, I was with a teacher's college group. And um, my upbringing was that if someone is talking to you, you don't turn and walk away. You wait until they've finished, you say something nice, you e close the conversation and then you walk away. But uh, I was standing there with two other people listening to these um, people, officials talking and um, and I could hear a woman's voice saying, leave in a very panicked voice saying, leave now. You have to leave now. Leave now. Well, I didn't because I thought that would be rude. And I was um, in, in a thrown into a state of anxiety that I was trying very hard to uh, to conceal because I wanted to turn and run because some, I knew something was going to happen if I didn't. Uh, but I didn't. I stayed to be polite and then I excused myself. I got in my car. I drove about 75 metres down the road and got hit by a car. So um, it's my guess that that accident should never have happened to me if I had listened to that message. Um, but it did, and uh, and they took the responsibility, the ETs, because I have been part of their program and um, have had many visitations on board with other experiencers and groups for various purposes. They took it upon themselves to uh, put implants in, which minimised some of the effects uh, to my health. But also I think um, they were used as a tracking mechanism because um, some years later, um, I was travelling on a country road or a country highway from between one city and another with two friends. We'd been to a concert and um, and suddenly I felt wired up is the best way to describe it. And I knew in my mind that they were around. They were in the sky somewhere around us. And within minutes, um, we came across what appeared to be a roadblock. Um, in the middle of the highway. We were on a plane, a flat plane that goes for miles.